Okay, can you hear me? Subcommittee will come to order. Chair recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. There is no disagreement that the current Medicare physician reimbursement system, the sustainable growth rate or SGR, is broken. Time and again, Congress has had to override schedule cuts in physician reimbursement to avert disaster. And we will have to do it again before the end of this year. Absent congressional actions, um, physicians will face a 27% cut starting January 1, 2013. There's also no disagreement that the SGR needs to be replaced with something that actually is sustainable and reimburses for outcomes and quality instead of just volume of services. The focus of today's hearing is not the well-documented deficiencies of the current system. It is about the future. What should the new physician payment system look like? And what can we learn from the private sector's experience in this area that may serve as a roadmap for reform? What has been tried and failed? And what has worked? Our witnesses today are here to share with us the innovative payment systems and care delivery models they've experimented with and their outcomes. And I want to thank all of them for their testimony. So thank you. I yield the remainder of my time to the vice chair of the subcommittee, Dr. Burgess. And I thank the chairman for the recognition. It has been a, a very interesting congressional term. Uh, we're now 18 months into it. I think this term, I've seen more work done on this problem than I had at any other time that I had been in Congress. But we're still pretty far away from the goal that we all expect to achieve. Everyone on both sides of the dais accepts the premise that the SGR has got to go. The conversation about actual innovative replacements that providers in the future, and, and really, would, I do want to ensure, my, my vision is that people will have options, that they will not see a one-size-fits-all that we think is best for their practice, but they will actually be able to choose the option that is best for their practice. Um, but in the meantime, we've got to sketch out the means by which to ensure that Medicare beneficiaries can continue to see their physicians. We've been in the process of testing models for years. The witnesses at the table also have been in the process of developing models for some time. And we expect that they're going to have some interesting ideas to share with the committee and look forward to that. But we've got a cut coming in just a few months and a lot of uncertainty as we face elections, while we face expiration of existing tax policy, we face the payroll tax holiday ending, we face, un face unemployment insurance needing to be extended, and oh yeah, who can forget all the collegiality that existed in this body a year ago with the discussion of the debt limit. 
we're likely to face that again, but this time without all of the good feelings that we all had last August. We could have taken this problem and moved it a little farther away from December, recognizing that December is going to be such an uncomfortable month from so many reasons. I had, and many members on this committee, had asked for a two-year extension in December of last year. A two-year extension passed without a lot of other things attached to it so that it would be sure to pass. In fact, we could probably do it on suspension on a Monday afternoon. But I didn't get that. We didn't get that. You didn't get that. And as a consequence, we got a one-year extension, or what ended up being a one-year extension, uh, that expires in the middle of this, uh, this fiscal holocaust at the end of the year. So all I would suggest is we know that we're not likely to end up doing something that will provide that long-term relief and long-term replacement for the sustainable growth rate by December 31st. I wish we could, but I've been here long enough to know that that is a, that is a goal that's going to be difficult to achieve. But what I would like to suggest is this month, before the August recess, the House of Representatives could pass yet an additional extension to give us that two years that we asked for in December of last year so that we had time to fully vet and evaluate the proposals that are before us. Our committee staff has done a good job in developing some of these ideas. It's now up to us to take them to doctors across the country and get their feedback so we get the best possible policy. So I will be introducing that legislation later today or this week to extend the SGR for an additional year. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the recognition. I'll yield back to you the time. The chair thanks the gentleman and now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Plum, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me um, associate myself with the remarks of, of Dr. Burgess. Um, of course, I don't know how he's paying for the two-year extension, so I won't associate myself with that until I see what the pay for is. But I think that what he said um, overall is very true. Um, I think we have to be very honest with the physician community. We all agree that um, the SGR needs to be replaced. Um, but, you know, the question is, is there a political will to do that? And um, whether or not it can be done effectively uh, by the end of the year with all these other problems that need to be addressed out there is, is very questionable. I, I don't have any doubt that this committee and the members of this committee would like to accomplish that, but I don't know whether or not the, the House or the GOP leadership, uh, you know, would be uh, willing to put it uh, on the agenda. Uh, for a long-term fix. Um, I, I, I want to go beyond, though, what, what um, Dr. Burgess said and, sa and, and say that I also think that we have to be very careful that when we talk about pay-fors, because pay-fors, it's not only a question of a new formula, but also the pay-for. Um, I think we have to be very careful. Um, we need a pay-for that's big. Uh, I have always suggested the Overseas Contingency Operation Fund, or the peace dividend, as it's, as it's called for, to pay for, because we need a large amount of money. And I think that this idea of constantly picking uh, at uh, other providers, uh, whether it's hospitals or it's nursing home or it's home health care providers, is not the way. It, it bothers me many times when I hear other physicians say, well, you know, we can take it from other parts of the health care system. I don't see that. And I would also warn my GOP colleagues that I certainly will not support, and I think it's, it's useless politically to try to take the money away from the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you know, we're, I, I don't want to say for sure, but so many times the answer has been, oh, you know, let's get rid of the prevention fund, let's get rid of the community health centers, let's get rid of, uh, you know, the subsidies or the tax credits that would uh, make uh, premiums more affordable for certain income. Uh, that's not the answer. Uh, I think that the health care system is in crisis. And the other providers have the same problems. And so for us to suggest that we're going to, uh, you know, go after the ACA or other providers, I think is, a, is, is really a huge mis mistake. So the question remains, how do we fix it? I don't think there's, there's a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, any new payment system should rely upon improved outcomes, quality, safety, and efficiency. In addition, while there must be fee-for-service within the future payment system, we must stop rewarding doctors for volumes of services. Primary care must be strengthened and given special consideration, and a new system must better encourage coordinated care while incentivizing prevention and wellness within the patient. 
Now, there are a number of innovative programs that are currently underway across the country. We will hear today from two private payer plans that are learning and building on successes from such initiatives as pay for performance, patient-centered medical homes, bundled payments, and of course, arrangements with accountable care organizations. Many of these initiatives recognize the local needs of their marketplaces, which is something worthy of consideration moving forward. Local markets have different needs, and while one payment model may work in New Jersey, it doesn't necessarily work in Montana. While we're eager to hear from the private sector, we mustn't forget about the delivery system reforms already underway in the public sector. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, created by the Affordable Care Act, gives CMS the ability to pursue many similar demonstration programs in both Medicare and Medicaid. Currently, they are testing a few new models, including ACOs and the patient-centered medical homes. The ACA also strengthens incentives for reporting on quality measures for physicians. Meanwhile, in 2011, Medicare began paying a 20% incentive payment to primary care physicians for primary care services nationwide. So together, the public and private sectors can and should work together to get the health care system on a better path to sustainability. And I look forward to hearing today about the exciting work being done in this field. I want to thank our witnesses. I want to especially note the American College of Surgeons who have taken a leading role on conceptualizing a new proposal to replace the SGR, which they're going to talk about today. And again, Mr. Chairman, I, I think this is a very important hearing. I appreciate your having it. Uh, this committee um, has worked uh, effectively um, on dealing with, um, the, um, with PDUFA and other things on a bipartisan basis. I think we can do the same here. Am I yield? Um, Ten seconds. Am I yielding? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I guess I'm out of time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gangry, for five minutes for opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I, I won't take the entire five minutes, but thank you for recognizing me. Uh, the sustainable growth rate, we all know, is broken system, and, and, and none of us support it, and, and it must, it must go. Uh, therefore, I look forward to the testimony of those here today, our witnesses, uh, on what payment models might be used to replace SGR. Uh, I do want to mention uh, one thing. House uh, Republican physicians worked very closely with the House leadership last year to put forward a multi-year SGR patch. I think my colleague, as I walked in, Dr. Burgess, was talking about that. It wasn't the full repeal that I wanted, but it ensured some level of stability for physicians and our patients. Ultimately, we couldn't get the Senate on board, and it, and it failed, as you all know. Now we find ourselves facing SGR cuts again in January of, what, 27.4 percent if something is not done. I urge this Congress to put partisan and election politics aside and let's work together to get rid of SGR once and for all. Uh, I, I don't agree with my uh, colleague from uh, New Jersey, the ranking member of the Health Subcommittee, in regard to the pay-fors, and and it, and but I do agree with him that that's a huge problem, how we're going to pay for the cliff. Uh, and the, the last figure I saw of, of that cliff uh, to bring the baseline back down to zero was something of the, uh, the magnitude of $300 billion. But that OCO money, we talked about that, and that kicked around, kicked around by the Super Committee Overseas Contingency Operation. Honestly, from my perspective, it, it really looks like funny money. Uh, very much like funny money, and you can't convince me that it isn't. Uh, I agree with Mr. Pallone in, in his concerns, of course, about uh, goring, uh, oxing the gore or goring the ox or whatever of other providers within the, in the Medicare program. Every one of them are uh, concerned about cutbacks and taking money out of whether it's home health care or or hospice or whatever. I agree with him on that point, but uh, I'm not for OCO money. Uh, I'll just conclude by saying that uh, uh, myself and the GOP Doctors Caucus, my colleagues, uh, 21 of us, will be working with leadership again in the House and also with our Democratic colleagues because there's no way to get this done uh, in a, in a one-party a majority party effort. It's, this has got to be done in a bipartisan way. Uh, and indeed, the House can't fix the problem alone. It has to be bicameral. So, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling the hearing uh, together uh, today. This hearing is hugely important. 
Uh, we can all work together. We have to uh, to get this done, and I'm looking forward to this expert uh, panel of witnesses. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Is there anyone else seeking time on this side of the aisle? If not, Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, would like to start by acknowledging and welcoming the bipartisan interest in transforming the Medicare physician payment system from one that focuses on rewarding volume to one that focuses on rewarding quality and outcomes. While Congress has yet to come to a bipartisan agreement on how to accomplish the shared goal of repealing and replacing the flawed sustainable growth rate, SGR mechanism, there seems to be bipartisan agreement that it should be done. Uh, we must find a way to end the unsustainable system of cuts that loom over physicians every year. The uncertainty created by the current system serves no one well. The physicians who have no stability in payments, the beneficiaries who worry about access to their doctors, and even Congress. Even more encouraging is the bipartisan agreement that delivery system reforms, many of which were included in the Affordable Care Act, hold promise in a post-SGR world. We must work towards a new way of paying for care for both physicians and other providers that encourages integrated care improving care for individuals, improving care for populations, and reducing costs. Right now, the way we pay for care doesn't always support these goals. The Affordable Care Act makes major strides to improve the way Medicare deals with physicians and other providers. Some of the new care models supported by the ACA include accountable care organizations, bundled payments, medical homes, and initiatives that boost primary care and encourage f encouraging paying for value and outcomes, not uh, volume. And as we will hear today, the private sector is exploring these avenues as well. I yearn for the day when the Republicans knew how to handle this problem. They simply extended the SGR uh, payments and didn't pay for it. They didn't do a lot of things to pay for what they uh, charged to the taxpayers of the United States, to wars, the Medicare prescription drug benefit, SGR, sure, didn't pay for it. Now they want to be sure that every way to pay for this is airtight. Well, it's a new, it's a new day where Republicans uh, are giving us their f fiscal responsibility side of things. We need to work together. Uh, our goal should be to enact a permanent repeal to the existing flawed physician payment system this year. Let's do it this year. We had chances to do it, as Mr. Burgess pointed out, but we couldn't get the Republican leadership, his Republican leadership, to go along with what he and we wanted. So it's time for the Republican leadership to recognize this is a problem that we ought to resolve, not just, well, I guess, not just kick, down, kick it down the road, but I guess we'd be satisfied just for that for a couple of years. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we got to get on with the job of doing what's responsible. I want to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Dingle. Mr. Chairman, I thank the gentleman from California for his kindness to me. I have a splendid statement. I ask unanimous consent that the fullness of it be inserted in the record. Without I commend my sir. colleagues on the Republican side for their desire to uh, keep Medicare fiscally solvent, to address the SGR problem, and to see to it that we fix the concerns of the medical profession and seeing to it that they're properly compensated. Their complaint is a real and a valid one, and it is a thing to which we should pay <coughs> heed. As any good physician will tell you, we need to cure the underlying problem, not to just treat the symptoms. And the patchwork job that we have done in addressing these problems over the years has done nothing but to create a growing and painful problem which gets worse and worse as time passes. So curing the matter for once and all with proper attention from this committee, as we have done in the past, in a bipartisan fashion, is the way out of this thicket. I commend my colleagues on both sides for this, and I look forward to working with them towards that very important end. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now we'll re introduce today's panel. Um, first, Mr. Scott Sirota is President and Chief Executive Officer of Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Second, Dr. 
Bruce Nash, who's Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of the Capital District Physicians Health Plan. Thirdly, Dr. David Bronson is President of the American College of Physicians. Then Dr. David Hoyt is the Executive Director of the American College of Surgeons. And finally, Dr. Kavita Patel is the Managing Director for Clinical Transfer Transformation and Delivery at the Engelberg Center for Healthcare Reform at the Brookings Institution. Your written testimony will be made a matter of the record. We ask that you summarize in five minutes. Mr. Schroeder, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. You poke that button there to see. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. I'll try again. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the Health Subcommittee for inviting me here to testify today. Uh, I am Scott Sirota, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, which represents 38 independent community based Blue Cross Blue Shield companies that collectively provide health care coverage for 100 million Americans. I commend the subcommittee for convening today's hearing. Blue plans are leading, are leading efforts in their communities to implement payment, benefit, and delivery system reforms that will improve quality and rein in costs. We believe that Medicare can not only learn from, but also, also should align with these successful initiatives. <coughs> Today I'd like to focus on three interrelated strategies. First, blue plans are changing payment incentives by putting in place models that move away from fee-for-service and link reimbursement to quality and outcomes. The goal is to promote patient-centered care that pays for desired outcomes rather than the number or intensity of service. These payment innovations include pay-for-performance initiatives, bundled payment arrangements in more than 32 states, arrangements with accountable care organizations in 29 states, and patient-centered medical homes, with Blue Plans collectively supporting the nation's largest network of medical homes in 39 states. These models are driving substantial improvements in care quality while taking avoidable costs out of the system. For example, Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield's medical home initiative includes 3,600 primary care physicians and nurse practitioners caring for 1 million members. Preliminary 2011 results indicate that 60 percent of the eligible primary care panels earned outcome incentive awards, which are based on a combination of savings achieved and quality points. Among these panels, costs were 4.2 percent less than expected. In Pennsylvania, Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield's Quality Blue Pay for Performance Program has prevented 42 wrong site surgeries, reduced hospital acquired infections, raised breast cancer screening rates nine points above the national average, all while saving $57 million over four years. Our second strategy is to partner with clinicians to give them individualized support to be successful under new payment and care delivery models. This includes sharing data about a patient's full continuum of care, helping improve the way care is delivered, enhancing care coordination, and providing powerful health IT capabilities. For example, a powerful way to improve the quality of care for beneficiaries with chronic illness is to enhance care coordination. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey has partnered with Duke and Rutgers universities to train at least 200 nurses as practice-based population care coordinators in medical homes and other settings. This first-of-its-kind nurse training curriculum recognized the, the workforce enhancement necessary to enable a statewide expansion of medical homes. None of these innovations would succeed without our, without our third strategy, engaging patients. This includes providing information on cost and quality to help patients make informed decisions about their care, tiered benefit designs that encourage patients to seek care from high-quality providers, and tools for members to improve their health and wellness. For example, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association's National, cost, National Consumer Cost Tool lets members obtain information on estimated costs for more than 100 of the most commonly billed elective procedures for hospitals, ambulatory surgery centers, and freestanding radiology centers in nearly every U.S. zip code. In addition, Blue Plans are using health informatics from a database of, uh, a health, a database of claims data from more than 110 million individuals collect nationwide collected over a seven-year history. The analytics capability made possible by Blue Health Intelligence, or BHI, 
are resulting in healthier lives and more affordable access to safe and effective care. For example, BHI collaborated with Independence Blue Cross in Pennsylvania to determine the best performing facilities in bariatric surgery. Looking at three years of data, BHI analyzed potentially avoidable complications at 214 facilities and identified Pennsylvania's Crozier Chester Medical Center as having an extraordinarily low complication rate for bariatric surgery, just four hundredths of a percent compared to the nationwide average of 6.7 percent. We designated Crozier as a best-in-class provider in this specialty under the Blue Distinction Initiative, which encourages patients to seek care from high-quality providers. Achieving a high-quality, affordable care system will require a multifaceted approach using all the strategies which I have outlined. Sustaining and building on these successes will require a continuously evolving approach of fine-tuning strategies and implementing new ones. We believe a compelling opportunity exists to accelerate Medicare's adoption of these private sector, sector initiatives. Payment approaches and technical assistance must be adapted to fit local delivery system conditions, which vary widely. This assumes patients can meet practices where they are, rather than attempting to overlay a one-size-fits-all solution that may not be workable. The time is right to accelerate the pace of reform for Medicare, and we are pleased that Blue Plans are participating in pilots to test these approaches and urge successful approaches be expanded rapidly beyond pilot markets. I appreciate the opportunity, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And I recognize Dr. Nash for five minutes for opening statement. Good morning. My name is uh, Bruce Nash. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Capital District Physicians Health Plan, which is based in Albany, New York. CDPHP, as we are known, is a not-for-profit, physician-sponsored network model plan with close to 400,000 members who live in the 24 counties in upstate New York. We are the Capital District's largest provider of managed commercial, Medicare, and Medicaid products. I also serve as the chairman of the Medical Director's Council for the Alliance of Community Health Plans, or ACHP, whose members include 22 of the nation's leading nonprofit regional health plans who share our commitment to the Triple Aim, a concept created by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, that is, improving the patient's experience of care, improving the health of populations, and reducing the per capita cost of care. CDPHP was founded by the physicians of the Albany County Medical Society 28 years ago, and to this day is governed by a board whose majority are practicing physicians who are elected by their peers. Our board chair is also required to be a practicing physician. As a consequence, we have enjoyed a close relationship with our provider community, enabling us to de deploy market-leading initiatives that improve the care delivery for our members, despite not directly employing any of the clinicians. This has led to us being recognized as a top-ranked health plan in the state and the nation for our member satisfaction and quality metrics. Four years ago, our board emerged from a strategic planning session with a directive for management to address the impending primary care crisis. It was noted that our local medical school was no longer graduating significant numbers of new physicians who were choosing primary care as a career. While the causes for this were multiple, we chose to focus on improving a primary care physician's income potential. It was clear for this to be accomplished, it would have to be funded by changing the way physicians practiced with more effective and efficient care as a result. This began the program that we later labeled our Enhanced Primary Care Program, or EPC. We began with an initial pilot of three practices, and over a two-year period of time, we were able to demonstrate an improvement of 14 of 18 specific quality metrics, a 15 percent reduction in hospital utilization, a 9 percent reduction in emergency department usage, a 7 percent reduction in uh, the use of advanced imaging. All of this resulted in an $8 per member per month savings in total health care costs. On the strength of these early data, CGPHB expanded its EPC program by establishing training programs for selected practices lasting 12 months and requiring significant co commitment of time and effort uh, from the practices as they learn the basics of enhanced primary care. We currently have 75 such practices representing 384 providers and almost 100,000 of our members. We are now launching our next cohort, with an, which will add an additional 70 practices. While much of what I have described is common to many successful patient-centered medical home initiatives nationally, we believe our unique contribution to this effort has been the creation and deployment of a novel reimbursement me methodology. This model involves a risk-adjusted global payment for all services that the physician provides in conjunction with a significant bonus based upon the elements of the triple aim, the patient's experience of care, the quality, and the cost efficiency. It creates an opportunity for a physician to enhance his or her reimbursement by, uh, on average, 40%. Our base payment is a unique global payment to the practice for each of their patients. 
if this is driven by a severity factor that was developed for our use by the scientists associated with Veris Health Inc., a global analytics firm. This severity for, uh, score predicts the amount a primary care physician should be paid for a specific patient based upon the diagnoses of that patient. This score is then multiplied by a conversion factor to determine the payment for that given patient based upon their plan type, that is commercial Medicare or Medicaid, and we pay this to, pra to the practice on a monthly basis. We still pay fee-for-service for a small sub subset of physician services, about 15 percent. These payments represent things that we would like to incent the primary care physicians to do in their office as opposed to referring to a specialist, such as minor skin biopsies, or for the acquisition cost of things like immunizations. The bonus or pay for performance aspect of the model is focused on the triple aim. We measure the satisfaction of the practice's patients to determine the bonus eligibility for the practice. Currently, we utilize HEDIS metrics to measure the quality of care delivery. A weighted average of 18 distinct metrics creates a quality score for the practice. Our efficiency metric is an output of our impact intelligence software, which accomplishes the required risk adjustment across the total cost of care. The annual bonus payment to a practice is determined in a manner that has been described as a tournament system. Simply said, practices need to perform better than other practices in the network to achieve their optimal payout. Our initial data for the EPC program is based on a population of only 12,000 members. We are fortunate that the Commonwealth Fund has provided a grant to an external evaluator, Dr. David Bates of the Brigham and Women's Hospital, to evaluate our 2012 experience. These data will become available in the latter half of 2013. CDPHP has also been active in the de uh, development of alternative reimbursement models for certain specialists and hospital partners. While we have yet to develop the experience that we have with the EPC program, we firmly believe that all comp components of the delivery system need to engage with us in payment models that align financial incentives with the needs of our community. Thank you for inviting me to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now recognizes Dr. Bronson for five minutes for opening statement. Good morning. I'm David Bronson, president of the American College of Physicians, the nation's largest medical specialty organization representing 133,000 internal medicine specialists who care for patients in primary care and comprehensive care settings internal medicine subspecialists, and medical students who are considering a career in internal medicine. I reside near Cleveland, Ohio. I am board certified in internal medicine and practice at the Cleveland Clinic on, on, uh, on the downtown campus. I'm also president of Cleveland Clinic Regional Hospitals and a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Thank you very much for allowing us to share our perspective. This morning, instead of rehashing all the reasons why the SGR must be repealed, I will focus on the innovative solutions being championed by ACP and others, others at the table, I might add, uh, within the medical profession. First, ACP recommends that the patient-centered medical home model of care be supported for broad Medicare adoption. The patient-centered medical home is an approach to providing comprehensive primary care in a setting that focuses on the relationships between patients, their primary care physician, and other health care professionals. This care is characterized by the following features. A personal physician for each patient, a physician-directed medical practice, uh, where the personal physician leads a team of individuals trained to provide comprehensive care, and a place where treatment team can assist the patient in meeting their specific health care needs. The patient-centered medical home practices provide increased access to care to prevent avoidable emergency room and hospital use, processes to facilitate care coordination amongst all physicians, and, 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 on, and address chronic illnesses prevalent within the Medicare population, including patient self-management education. These and other features of the medical home contribute to the increase in quality of care and reducing avoidable costs to patients in the health systems. Patient-centered medical homes use quality management tools such as registries and outcomes reporting to proactively manage the health care of a whole practice population. There is an extensive and growing body of evidence on this medical home's effectiveness in improving outcomes and lowering costs. To cite just one example, in Genesee County, Michigan, the Genesee Health Plan, in collaboration with local physicians and hospitals, formed the Genesis HealthWorks. This model, which is built upon a strong, redesigned primary care infrastructure, has demonstrated both significant cost savings and improved quality. Many large insurers, including United Health, WellPoint, CareFirst, and the Blue Cross Blue Shield affiliates, are in the process of scaling up their efforts in the medical home to thousands of primary care physician practices and tens of millions of rollies across the country. In my practice at the Cleveland Clinic, all the primary care practice physicians and taking care of adults are certified by the NCQA at the highest level for, for, as medical homes. 
From the public sector, CMS Innovation Center is in the process of rolling practices in its comprehensive primary care initiative. Primary care practices enrolled in this initiative will receive new public and private funding for primary care. So not included in the primary care functions, not included in the fee-for-service payments, and we'll have the opportunity to share net savings generated through the program. 54 commercial and state insurers are joining with Medicare to support approximately 500 participating practices in seven markets. The bottom line is that the medical home is no longer just an interesting concept, but a reality for uh, millions of Americans and thousands of practices. The commercial insurers are driving these innovations in many markets. This can also become a reality for Medicare patients. To accomplish this, Congress needs to accelerate Medicare's ado adoption of the medical home model by providing higher payments to physician, physician practices that have achieved recognition by deemed private sector accreditation bodies consistent with the standards to be developed by the Secretary. At a subsequent stage, performance metrics could be added and incorporated into the Medicare payment policies. By supporting the PCMH, Medicare will accelerate the national adoption of this innovative approach to improving the health care system. The goal should be to promptly uh, uh, implement the payment policies to steadily grow physician and patient participation in medical homes over the next several years. Second, Congress should enact payment policies to accelerate the adoption of the related medical home neighborhood. This concept is essential to the ultimate success of the medical home. It recognizes that specialty and subspecialty practices and others that provide treatment in the, to the patient be recognized and provided with incentives to work together in a collaborative manner. With, with the patient-centered medical home neighborhood program, primary care physicians and specialists work together to proactively reduce duplication, enhance quality, and reduce preventable hospitalizations. Specifically, ACP proposes that Congress help increase non-primary care specialist participation in the medical home neighborhood project by offering higher payment levels for those services. In my practice, PCPs and cardiologists specializing in heart failure have developed coordinated early intervention programs that have improved quality, reduced preventable admissions, and saved health care dollars. Third, Congress should establish Medicare incentives to physicians to incorporate evidence-based guidelines from national specialty societies into shared decision-making with patients. We think that's a vital step that's imp important to get there. And finally, ACP believes that additional steps should be taken now to help physicians to move towards models aligned with value for patients. As well, as well as rewarding those who have taken leadership and risk in participating in new models like medical homes and ACOs. Even as new models are being more thoroughly developed and pilot tested, physicians could get higher updates for demonstrating they have successfully participated in such programs. In conclusion, ACP that believes that for the first time in many years we can begin to see a vision for a better future where the SGR no longer endangers access to care Medicare recognizes and supports the value of primary and coordinated care, and where every person is enrolled in, Medic in Medicare has access to a highly functioning primary care practice through certified medical homes with, and other promising care coordination models. The current system disincents the use of, moder of modern practice approaches that are proven to improve quality, prevent hospitalization, and save lives. Uh, th thank you for your time, and I'm pleased to answer questions. Okay. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Dr. Court. Uh, Hoyt, I'm sorry, uh, recognized for five minutes. Chairman Pitts, uh, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the committee, I wish to thank you for inviting the American College of Surgeons to discuss the role of quality in improving the Medicare physician payment system. My name is David Hoyt. I'm a trauma surgeon and the executive director of the American College of Surgeons. The ACS pr appreciates your recognition that the current Medicare physician payment system and its sustainable growth rate formula are fundamentally flawed. We wish to be a partner in the effort to develop a long-term solution that improves the quality of care while helping to reduce costs. My comments today will focus on the college's efforts in an area of quality improvement and the use of an ACS uh, program to uh, propose a Medicare physician payment proposal called the Value-Based Update, or VBU. Our belief is that any new payment system should be part of an evolutionary process that achieves the ultimate goals of increasing quality for the patient and reducing growth in health care spending. Over the past year, we have developed our quality improvement principles into the VBU, a Medicare physician payment reform proposal. Our proposal is predicated on Congress finally eliminating the current SGR formula and fully offsetting the cost of permanent appeal, repeal. I will caution you that this is still a draft proposal. We look forward to working with Congress and other stakeholders to continue to develop this option. 
In developing the VBU, we took the lessons learned in the American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, or NISQIP, and other quality improvement efforts and sought to expand them into the larger provider community. At the outset, we had a number of key concepts in mind. To be practical, we felt that the proposal must be patient-centric, politically viable, responsive to the changing needs of the health care system, and inspired by quality. Specifically, our proposal first complements the quality-related payment incentives in current law and regulation while making necessary adjustments in the current incentive uh, programs to facilitate participation by specialists. Secondly, it incorporates the improvement of quality and the promotion of appropriate utilization of care into the annual payment updates. Third, it accounts for the varying contribution of different practices to the ability to improve care and reduce costs. And finally, it creates a mechanism to incentivize the provision of appropriate services that primary care can bring to the management of increasingly more complex medical populations. The VBU accomplishes these goals by allowing physicians who successfully participate in CMS quality programs to choose quality goals for the specific patients or conditions they treat. Rather than basing compensation on overall volume and spending targets, the VBU bases performance on carefully designed measures. The VBU is designed to break down the silos of care amongst physicians and to begin to measure service lines of care. The central component of the VBU is the Clinical Affinity Group, or CAG. Each CAG will have its own patient-oriented, outcomes-based, risk-adjusted quality measures designed to foster continuous improvement and help lower costs. These measures will be crafted in close consultation with the relevant stakeholders, including the specialty societies, who in many cases are already developing measures and other quality programs on their own. Providers will self-select their clinical affinity group, but will have to meet certain eligibility requirements based on patients they see and conditions they treat. Physicians whose specialties would work in concert to meet specific quality measurement goals, which if met, would improve care and help drive down the cost of care. Physicians would be measured against me benchmarks that both uh, occur at a national and regional level, allowing for continued innovation with medical communities. Finally, once implemented, physicians will have the opportunity to select their CAG on an annual basis. Goals can be adjusted regularly to ensure that the quality of care provided to the patient is continuously improving. Annual updates would then be predicated on this quality improvement. We believe this kind of a system will take five to seven years to fully implement. The college strongly believes that improving quality and safety offers the best chance for tra transforming our health care system. Cost reduction alone cannot be the primary driving force of change. Change must instead be driven by quality measurement. The ACS has a rich history in quality improvements, and we have distilled what we have learned into four basic principles. First, set appropriate standards. Second, build the right infrastructure to deliver the care. Third, use the right data to measure performance. And fourth, expose yourself to external verification through peer review. The ACS NISQIP program is built on these principles and is the prime example of how properly structured quality improvement leads to cost savings. Participating hospitals have been seen to reduce uh, expensive complications, and it's these same principles that we are uh, in this program uh, promoting for a Medicare physician payment system. Our next payment system should focus on individual patients and patient populations and rely on physician leadership to achieve improved outcomes, quality, safety, efficiency, effectiveness, and patient involvement. Improving outcomes and care, and care processes and slowing the growth of health care spending are, in fact, complementary objectives. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to uh, participate in this hearing. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now recognize, recognize Dr. Patel for five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the Health Subcommittee for inviting me to testify today on this important topic. My name is Kavita Patel, and I am a fellow at the Engelberg Center for Health Care Reform at the Brookings Institution and a practicing primary care physician. Industries are often challenged with redefining what their business models are and how they produce value. Health care is at this crossroad now. As a country, we are presented with an opportunity to make care and how we pay for it 
more rational, more productive, and better able to meet the needs of the American people. I would like to highlight the following key points and then elaborate with a couple of clinical examples to illustrate a pathway forward in the near and short term away from our current, current fee-for-service system. Uh, one thing that's very clear is that our current reimbursement system does not incentivize the type of clinical practice efficiency that promotes value in care. We have heard from my other panelists, and as all of you have testified yourselves, this is a fact. Number two, innovations in clinical practice must be paired with timely and usable data from CMS and other payers, robust quality metrics, and transparent measurement that is consistent. The timeliness and transparency of this is essential. Receiving data a year or even six months after your clinical practices are going on is not going to help physicians and other clinicians change the way they deliver care in that moment. And this has been an often criticized setback from a multitude of payers. And third, over the next several years, not decades, not even more than five years, I would say over the next several years, we must migrate towards a model that deals with coordination of care, as other panelists have outlined, but more importantly, sets a sight on translating that coordination of care into a larger episodic or more globally based payment model that takes into consideration the very flexibilities that we need for different types of clinical efficiencies. One size does not fit all, and we must therefore allow for flexibility in this transition. In this process, however, the importance of taking what we're currently doing right now and translating that into something that is more coordinated towards the path of flexibility is the way to move forward today from our current system. In, for example, the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation has already called upon a number of specialties to say, what are we doing right now that we do not need to be doing? This is something that the professional societies have corralled around to say, here are the top five things we each know that we do not need to be doing. This is a perfect basis from which we can take current reimbursement and translate that by clinically evidence-informed models into a different form of payment towards that pathway for more coordinated care. I will offer you an example in cardiology, since that gives us a great way of identifying, one, something that the professional societies have agreed to. For example, in cardiology, a universal recommendation was to not perform stress cardiac imaging or advanced non-invasive imaging in the initial evaluation of patients without cardiac symptoms unless high-risk cardiac markers are present. Sounds very straightforward. However, this is a very costly expense to Medicare today. So translating some of these services that have been brought forward by physicians and other clinical leaders into a case-based payment could get us on a pathway away from what we currently do today. Two practices in very different parts of the country are already doing this in cardiology and have found reductions in cardiac spending on the level of millions of dollars, but they can't get payers to take them up on it. They are simply proposing a novel way to translate how they deliver care to patients with chest pain and with congestive heart failure by communications between primary care physicians, cardiologists, hospitalists, surgeons, and other specialists. A way to actually communicate through text messaging, email, when we need to have a consult with a cardiologist, allowing for primary care physicians to be able to readily access that specialist. An open and honest, timely delivery of data between physicians will allow for this type of case coordination that I describe, all with the purpose of helping to teach clinicians how they can better reduce the numbers of services that they provide that they have acknowledged do not provide value. That's one example in cardiology. The second example, a short one, in primary care and behavioral health, we have a critical shortage of psychiatrists and mental health professionals in this country, yet depression and other mental illnesses are an overwhelming problem in primary care. Translating some of what we currently do to allow for better collaboration between a telepsychiatrist, for example, who does not need to see a patient, 
and a primary care physician to offer advice for high risk management is exactly the type of payment model that can move us away from our fee for service system. I have many more examples with tangible savings that could be accomplished today. However, payers, including those that are public and private, need to be responsive to do this, and it can start with action by Congress. I hope that I've illustrated that not only does one size not fit all, but that there are absolutely elements of our current reimbursement system that we must retain in order to improve. And that instead, when we give providers more flexibility, we can accomplish this in both the short term as well as deal with what we've started with the SGR. I thank you and welcome any questions. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. And that concludes the opening statements. I have unanimous consent request. The chair requests the following statement be introduced in the record. It's a statement by Garrison Bliss, MD, President of Q Alliance Medical Group, Seattle, Washington. You've seen it without objection. It's so ordered. I'll now begin the questioning. Recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. Mr. Sirota, relatively small number of patients, perhaps 10%, especially those with chronic conditions and multi, multiple comorbidities may consume the majority of healthcare services and resources. It seems to make sense to target resources toward the care of those patients. How do you get physicians across specialties to do this? The idea of identifying those high-risk patients or those high-utilizing patients with uh, chronic uh, conditions is, is the, uh, essentially the essence of the health informatics that we use for clinical care. Uh, we work with providers to provide them comprehensive, uh, comprehensive look at their patient populations, all the care that they're receiving. We try to identify those uh, patients which are consuming care. And then the genesis or the foundation in a patient-centered medical home is to get the primary care physician to manage all of those uh, attributes, all of those providers that are participating in the care to uh, ensure that there's a lack of duplication and better coordination of the care that those patients receive. Dr. Nash, uh, your model appears to be a form of capitation payment. In the 1990s, uh, capitation arrangements fell into disfavor in many markets because of certain weaknesses. How does your model address those weaknesses? <clears throat> yeah, as stated among many physicians, when you bring up the C word, capitation, there's uh, a reaction. And a lot of that is from the experience of the 90s where many capitations were structured around actually putting physicians at risk for services that they didn't directly provide. So they weren't prepared to handle that financial risk. That's what an insurance company really needs to handle. So that's part one. The model we have is really for only the services the physician directly provides. The second major aspect, though, is capitations of those days were really uh, just age sex adjusted. So that I, as a, a family doc, you know, if I'm in my office and I'm paid on that model from the 90s, you know, if I had a 40-year-old patient come in to see me from a plan uh, being paid in that way, 40-year-old uh, male, but I happened to get one with diabetes and asthma, I was not paid adequately for that because it, I was being paid on the average. So this specific model pays more for the sicker patient. So we pay significantly more for that patient so the doctor can spend more time with that patient. Thank you. Dr. Bronson, we hear a lot about how primary care providers are undervalued in comparison to a specialist. Most people agree that a robust primary care workforce is essential. However, According to the Association of American Medical Colleges Center for Workforce Studies, there will be not only a shortage of about 45,000 primary care physicians, there will also be a shortage of 46,000 surgeons and medical specialists in the next decade. Yet, in a system with finite resources, how do you increase reimbursement for primary care without reducing reimbursement for specialists and thereby jeopardizing access to specialty care? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We strongly believe that the patient-centered medical home concept and the value concepts provided here will provide additional funding through, through shared, shared savings opportunities to support those initiatives. Okay. Dr. Hoyt, uh, how are physicians assigned to the clinical affinity groups you described? Do physicians self-assign or are they assigned automatically based on the patients they treat? Yeah. Uh, you know, we're still having a lot of discussion about that, but the general principle that you ask about is a physician would, would self-select. And the success of that, we believe, will be in getting the types of groups 
that would be naturally incentivized to work together to lower costs and improve quality would be the premise of these groups. Um, so, uh, you know, th there's going to be potentially some conflict in that if you are talking about the management of, uh, let's say, coronary syndromes. Uh, you're going to have specialists that right now are not necessarily uh, directly uh, incentivized to work together. But that's, that's in fact the concept, but somebody could control what they selected to be a part of, whether it's a coronary group or a GI group or an oncology group, based primarily on, on what they practice. Okay. And Dr. Patel, one major criticism of the ACO model is that it is overly prescriptive. It may work in one part of the country or for certain medical specialties, but not for everyone. Providers often complain that they need to make significant changes in their practices in order to comply with ACO requirements. How can Medicare incorporate innovative models that are more flexible and therefore less disruptive to existing practices? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Medicare is doing just that with trying to introduce, in addition to the accountable care organization model, other such models that incorporate other payers, such as the Advanced Primary Care Initiative and others that are going on as we speak. I do think it's worth noting that the accountable care organization movement has blossomed, and we now have over 2.5 million Medicare lives in the currently funded uh, Medicare Shared Savings Programs and Pioneer ACO programs. So adding that flexibility, I know, is critical to ensuring the, the retention of the, the clinical excellence in those beneficiaries. My time's expired. Chair, recognize the ranking member five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying to get in a bunch of questions here, so I'm going to ask you to be brief if you can. I'm shortening my questions. Many members have supported using, this is for Dr. Bronson and Dr. Hoyt. Many members have supported using the OCO funding, the Overseas Contingency Operation Funding, to offset the cost of repealing the SGR. There, there are even some Republicans who've supported it. So I wanted to ask you, would you support using the OCO funding as a way to pay for repealing SGR, and if not, do you have an alternative suggestion? Uh, Mr. Bronson first, I guess. Uh, th thank you, sir. Well, Dr. We are, Bronson. We are supportive of using the OCO concept for providing, providing this particular funding that's necessary for this program. I will add we're not experts in, 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 in funding and are open to other ideas. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. We would support uh, use of that for uh, the offset. Thank you both. Um, now, Dr. Bronson, um, I th there's a consensus that many of the delivery reform models discussed today hold promise for Medicare. However, it takes time to disseminate those models nationwide. In the meantime, there's clear evidence that there's a problem with the incentives for primary care payment. Are there steps we can take now that will help boost primary care and better reward primary care practitioners? Well, we very much believe that this is an, the first thing we need to do is really fix this SGR problem for all practices. Uh, without doing that, we don't have the flexibility that we need to go forward and improve primary care as effectively as we could. Uh, the, the, supporting the patient medical center at home initiatives is very important. In my personal practice, more than half of my patients as an internist are Medicare beneficiaries. It's hard to reorganize your practice and fully into a patient centered medical home if you're not getting reimbursed effectively for, by your largest payer. I, we need to move fast on this issue. Now, the July 6 proposed rule issued by CMS creates a new code for care management post-discharge. Do you believe that this new initiative is a good one, or is there anything else CMS can do to boost primary care? Uh, well, ab absolutely, uh, it, it, is, it is a good one and, and, a, and a necessary one, but it needs to be fil fil filtered into, more, more effort needs to be filtered into a comprehensive solution that changes the, pr the practice paradigm to manage populations and, pre and prevent uh, unnecessary, well, I shouldn't say unnecessary, uh, but preventable utilization. Okay. Now, I'm going to just ask a general question. I don't know what time's left here for anybody. Um, we all talk about getting rid of the SGR, but we really mean simply eliminating the formula that provides a global cap on spending unrelated to physician performance or quality. The underlying fee schedule, which payments are based off, would likely still remain. Um, you know, we've heard from witnesses at this hearing and others that at the heart of the fee schedule we have misvalued codes and payment incentives that still aren't aligned to value, the right care at the right time, and of course primary care, care remains undervalued. 
I'd like to ask any witness, uh, first, whether you support eliminating the SGR mechanism. I think the answer is yes, so let's just go to the second. Whether you believe that if the SGR mechanism is eliminated, we will still need to retain the fee schedule. And assuming there's agreement to retain the fee schedule, what needs to be done to better align payment incentives there? So my question is about the fee schedule. I guess I'll start with Mr. Soro to see how far we go with the time. Well, I'll try to, uh, I'll try to be brief. I think that uh, the most critical element is to link uh, reimbursement with outcomes and quality uh, and, and to begin to reimburse uh, providers based on the man managing, managing of populations rather than the episodic care. Uh, we can't get there overnight, so I think the elements of a fee schedule will have to remain in place for some period of time as we transition to a, a, differing, a different type of payment model. So I don't think it can be eliminated immediately, but I do think we have to evolve away from a fee-for-service model at some point. Dr. Nash? Uh, we have eliminated the fee schedule in the program that I'm speaking about. Uh, the, you know, it's been well demonstrated the fee-for-service just promotes more care, but I think the main message I would give is it limits innovation. It's really only rewarding for that face-to-face -face between the doctor and the patient. It really doesn't uh, reward for team-based care, doesn't reward for telephone care, web-based care, or a whole variety. So if we want comprehensive care, we should pay comprehensively. Dr. Bronson, you may be the last one because we're running I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with Dr. Nash. We, 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 ha we have important shortages in very, several specialties, primary care, general surgery. Uh, adjusting the fee schedule can help but uh, in, in, a, in a proactive way, but we need to go to a more comprehensive solution in the long run. Dr. Hoy? Well, we actually anticipate the need for this in our proposal by uh, anticipating the need to adjust primary care. But to your question, in the future, do we need a way to relatively value services? I think we still do, because background education, training, commitment to uh, various kinds of efforts is going to lead to a different valuation of some services. And I think the, our proposal would be to have physicians still be in charge of doing that. I realize that that seems self-interested, but we feel that, that as evidence through committees like the RUC, that that's really what the uh, RUC has been able to do. Maybe not always correctly in some people's minds, but it is really intended to try and, and foster that debate amongst physicians what the relative value of particular services is. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and now recognizes Dr. Burgess, five minutes for questions. Dr. Patel, you got left off that last sequence. Would, would you care to respond to the ranking member's question? Thank you. I, I would agree briefly that we should definitely improve on the fee-for-service elements, and there will be a need, as I mentioned, to retain elements such that when we move towards these more flexible payment models, we can incentivize the right behavior. And I do think it's about helping to cal recalculate what the relative value of those payments are to make them more accurate for what we actually want to achieve, which we don't have right now. And that's why I wanted you to give that answer, so I'm grateful that you did. Um, moving to a model that where fee-for-service no longer exists is uh, in some ways problematic because it, it is the world that many of us have practiced medicine for 25 years. It's the, year, the world that many of us grew up in. We understand it. Uh, we can converse easily about that world. At the same time, if there is, and I'll be honest with you, there are places in Texas where I don't honestly see how you do a bundled payment or uh, a value-based purchasing or an ACO model in Muleshoe, Texas, where you got one, one guy. I mean, I don't know how you do that. I mean, that person has to have a fee-for-service environment, at least in my limited view of the world. They have to have a fee-for-service environment. And if all of our effort with SGR reform is to move away from fee-for-service, what do you do with the patients who are seeing the doc in Muleshoe, Texas? Thank you for that question, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm from Texas myself and understand exactly the kinds of practices that you're speaking of. And I can tell you that that's why the element that really helps to link a way forward is retaining some of our current system that can help to continue, allow physicians to continue to deliver practices, such as you pointed out. But also, I would say to you that that physician and those of us who practice in more isolated settings or even smaller settings in a city 
what we're all looking for is a way to coordinate our care better and to reach out, just like we did in medical school and in training, to other colleagues that we know can help us respond to our patients' needs. So I think a step towards something that's different than what we have now is to allow the solo practicing doctor to be able to engage in a model for some of their patients that have high-risk cardiac conditions that need to go to San Antonio and coordinate care better there and reward that behavior. Right, and most, can we just stipulate for the record, since you're from Texas, that Muleshoe, Texas actually exists? I didn't just make that. <laughs> I, 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 I can, I'll tell you where it is on a map even, <laughs> yes. Um, but the, you know, when we've, when we've talked about this, and we have talked about it at the committee level, you know, where, how do you go to a world beyond fee-for-service? And it just seems to me we're going to have to, whatever we do with the SGR, and I know there are people who say we need alternative payment models, we need a value-based system, we, we need an ACO model, we need a bundled payment model, but honestly, we've got to allow for the rich panoply of practices that are out there to continue to thrive, because after all, the name of the game is not just reworking a formula. The name of the game is seniors need access to care. And right now, that access is not being re, is, is, is in jeopardy because of the actions taken by Congress that instituted this payment system. And then our last minute rescues every year have been, uh, have, have put practices on kind of a tenuous financial footing. If they've got to go to their banker for a short term note, at probably nine to twelve percent interest to fund because they their cash across the counter was reduced by fifteen percent because Congress said, "Oh, we just told you check at CMS until we get back from congressional recess." I mean that sort of activity is is just devastating to, to practices. So I want to see us figure that out. Now you talked a little bit about not doing tests that are not necessary. And I agree with that, but at the same time, I think anyone who's been in clinical practice also recognizes that people don't often uh, always function according to protocol. And I think one of the comments you made was in cardiology uh, that there were no testing, no, no uh, dynamic testing unless there are high risk markers present. Is, did I understand you? Did I understand you correctly with that? Yes, that's correct. That's from the American College of Cardiology. But we've all been in situations where we have that patient come in at the end of the day who describes an unnatural fatigue, and you say, okay, look, it's the end of the day, I'm tired, you're tired, we're all tired, go on about your business. But we've all had the situation where we've referred that patient on for testing, and in fact, she's been quite ill with really minimal symptoms, and had you not had that little spark of curiosity, you might not have done the. You might not have referred for the testing, and that. But now, if you've got someone looking over your shoulder, say, "Look, you are a high utilizer for this type of testing, and and these indications are very soft." Um, who's going to help us with the liability side of that question? So I'll try to respond briefly to two big of. Two. No, you can use as much time as you want. Okay. Chairman, Chairman's very very tolerant. I know him well. You well, may thank proceed. You, for that. Okay. you may proceed. Thank you for that. So the first element is that this cannot be something where it is, is, it is a dictum or a direction to providers that you may never. Notice that when the American College of Cardiology participated in identifying that very example around cardiac stress imaging, it wasn't, it, it is not a you must never do this. It was chosen as one of the conditions in which the profession can help to teach themselves and their own clinicians how to best deal with imaging issues when patients present. And that includes the ability to order that test when it is necessary, or you do have that spark of curiosity. So in the model that I'm describing for payment that helps to also deal with some of the issues you bring up of liability or feeling the responsibility to order something or not order something, it would be to take that we know that there is a proportion of payments that we're delivering in, this, in the fee-for-service system right now that are being used to deliver those services. Take a proportion of those payments and say to cardiologists, to internists, to family practice doctors in Texas and say, you know what? We know that there are things you don't like about the way you practice that are responsive to what you think might be issues around liability or things that might spark a curiosity, and you want the flexibility to deal with that. But what we will give you, we're not just gonna give you free reign, you can't just do what you want. What we want for you to do is agree to be responsible by following 
what your own profession and your own colleagues have said are the best informed evidence around an issue. Does that mean that it's 100% an absolute? No. Does that mean that we would need rich ability to measure what we're doing and learn from it? I think that's what's essential, and I think that's what physicians are craving. They want to know that they have some flexibility and autonomy to practice the way they want, but also to get the information that can help them be better. And that will help the very small businesses that are small practices to thrive in a newer business model and be more efficient. Chair, thank you, gentlemen. And now recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of the witnesses. This has been an excellent panel, and I think you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, we want a health care system that works. We want some innovation and experimentation, but uh, not, no one size fits all. And we've got to be open to uh, uh, looking at what, what makes sense uh, given the circumstances, of course, the main thing that makes sense at the moment is to is to deal with this SGR problem because it's nothing else seems to work if, unless we take care of SGR. That's why it's so frustrating that uh, we didn't use the OCO, which is just a bookkeeping thing, but the uh, SGR is just a bookkeeping thing, and we're stuck, and we ought to solve those uh, uh, two issues and pay for it and get this thing resolved. Dr. Patel, I'm not sure how closely you've been following what's been going on in the House of Representatives, uh, but last week the Republicans brought forward a bill to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Uh, not only does the Affordable Care Act provide countless benefits for families, such as protections against pre-existing condition exclusions and lifetime caps on coverage, tax breaks of $4,000 a year per family for health care, improved free preventive care, lowered out-of-pocket costs for prescription drugs, but the Affordable Care Act also includes important provisions to drive delivery reform in fee-for-service Medicare. Uh, one part of the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, provides for accountable care organizations within Medicare or bundled payment programs in Medicare. Um, the uh, law even established the Innovation Center, which is taking unprecedented steps to help providers, payers, and patient groups develop and spread new and successful innovations, including th uh, through medical homes and multi-payer initiatives. Obviously, uh, the Affordable Care Act is just one piece of improving quality and outcomes for Medicare, but I believe it's an important one. If the Republican plan to repeal the Affordable Care Act were to become law, what effect would that have on Medicare's work to improve quality and outcomes and realignment, uh, realign payment incentives to focus on value? Do you, be, do you believe that would be a setback? I do believe it would be a setback to turn back all of the important work that has been done in the last two years and beyond, even before the Affordable Care Act was passed around savings in the Medicare system, the Medicaid system. And then what's even more remarkable is that we can't turn back, even with the repeal, what has already taken place as a result of the important initiatives you mentioned, sir, in the private market. So now we've created a very complex web that's starting to produce some amazing results, as you've heard today. And so a repeal and any setback would really undo valuable work and send a signal, I believe, to clinicians around the country who are looking for a way to move forward. It certainly would send a signal to a lot of people who don't have health insurance that they're not going to have a, an opportunity to get health insurance because of the, of the barriers that they have been unable to overcome uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act being passed and being fully implemented. Uh, it occurs to me as I listen to the testimony that uh, our health system has hundreds if not thousands of groups pursuing reform in some way. Each health plan, provider organization, even Medicare and Medicaid has a slightly different take on a medical home or an accountable care organization, for example. I'm wondering how we ensure that all of these efforts are complementary, not contradictory. Dr. Patel, in your test testimony, you mentioned the need to identify mechanisms to further multi-payer efforts to transform the delivery system. I know that CMS is 
as a result of the new authority in the Affordable Care Act, is working on some of these multi-payer initiatives. For example, the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative is a collaborative effort between public and private payers and primary care practices to re reward care management. Uh, the multi-payer advanced primary care practice demonstration is developing state-led multi-payer collaborations with primary care practices to improve care. Dr. Patel, could you talk about why multi-payer initiatives are so important, we, what CMS uh, through the Affordable Care Act is doing in this area, and what more can be done? Multi-payer initiatives are critical because it's very hard for clinicians to provide care for only one stream of patients, measure quality on those patients, and then have a completely different set of expectations, incentives, and reporting, which is what's going on right now. So some of the important initiatives that you just mentioned at the state level, in the primary care setting, and even the accountable care organization model really send a strong signal to other payers, and that started with actions taken in Medicare by CMS as a result of the Affordable Care Act. So I do believe that the continuing work of encouraging but then also <coughs> having a way to set forward the actual mechanism for other payers to be involved. And that means, as I've said in my testimony, consistent quality measures. We can't have one set of quality measures that I report to for one payer, which is what I do in my practice now, and a completely different set of metrics for another. And that's where the multi-payer efforts are huge and critical. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognizes uh, Dr. Cassidy, five minutes for questions. As an open question to follow up on Mr. Waxman's affection for the ACA, uh, according to who you uh, listen to, Medicare is going bankrupt in five to 12 years. I'm sure he and his affection would love that ACA takes $500 billion in savings from Medicare and spends it elsewhere as opposed to shoring up the program. That's a feature that Republicans object to, and frankly, it's terrible for Medicare. But that's part of the ACA, and I'm sure he would not want that repealed either. That said, as a practicing physician myself, I've observed that only fiduciary linkage, uh, linkage between patient and physician seems to consistently lower cost. That's a little bit of a theme I've heard from you. Mr. Serrata, I am uh, curious. Do you do MA plans, Medicare Advantage programs? Well, we do have Medicare Advantage programs, yes. What is your ML? So you've got a very nice system where you're giving pot feedback. Each of you described this, Dr. Nash. I think, Dr. Patel, you go there, too, where you're giving feedback to the practicing physician. Clearly, that costs money. What is the MLR, your medical loss ratio, of the uh, MA plans that you have? Uh, it's widely varied by, based on the marketplace. I really don't have a single. Is it over 15 percent? The medical loss ratio yeah. itself, the administrative expense piece of yes. that? Um, in some markets, it may be. I now, mean, you're contracting with these physician groups. I'm assuming they have their own MLR, and Dr. Nash, you can weigh in as well. Are you doing, are you doing a Medicare Advantage as well? Uh, yes, we are. Now, so can I ask what you're contracting with the, are you directly contracting with CMS or with the uh, Medicare Advantage program? We, uh, our Medicare Advantage program is directly through CMS. So you, you are a MA plan? Correct. So you get, what's your MLR, may I ask? Well, the medical loss ratio is the amount of the premium that is spent on medical care. So we're in roughly, I, I think, about 88 percent or something of that nature. So your administrative cost is only 12 percent? Correct. Well, that's pretty good. Uh, so other plans similar to yours seem to have higher than that. I've been struck that some of the physician groups contracting with the insurance companies, the insurance company keeps 12, but then the medical plan itself has an additional MLR. Mr. Sirota is kind of nodding his head yes. It seems that in the aggregate, the MLR is greater than the 15% uh, or 20% defined by the uh, so loved ACA. Uh, now, if you didn't have the ability to do your data systems, would you be as effective in managing that care? I mean, yes. Uh, absolutely not. I mean, yeah. the data is essential for any of this. That wasn't a trick question. That seems so self-evident. Really. Um, by the way, I admire the fact that you as practicing physicians understand there's some things fee-for-service works better for. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, as a practicing doc, I also see that. Uh, so let me just kind of compliment you on that model. Now, for all of you, now, D Dr. Hoyt, it seems like yours is effectively a bundled payment system, correct? If somebody has, um, uh, I, have a <laughs> I have a pain in my neck, and it's not from any of you, it's just from a bad neck. Uh, so if I'm grimacing, that's the reason why. 
um, it seems like you're a bundled system. Somebody has colon cancer, they would come to you and uh, contract, if you will, for the management of that care. Is that correct? Well, in, in our system, bundled payments could be accommodated, but the system is really about updates for the overall uh, Medicare reimbursement on an annual basis. And it simply puts a group of physicians to quality metrics around a specific disease target or something like that. It doesn't necessarily, per se, bundle uh, the uh, responsibility by, uh, you know, that, that same group. But let me ask you, because really this is about finding ways to save enough money and translate those savings into doing away with SGR forever, once and for all, and continuing to reward patients for appropriate behavior, right. correct? Correct. And, and I think, you know, that is an assumption in our model that we have to prove through model, through we're, we're planning to do some modeling to actually see if, if it uh, shakes out. But uh, your, your comment that all of these attempts at cost savings is ultimately where the extra money comes from to pay for increased access or uh, uh, individual, more individualized care for higher risk patients, et cetera. It, that has to be the assumption that there's, yeah. there is some waste that can be had. Now, let me, no, Dr. Patel, I really liked your testimony. I liked it written. I liked the way you delivered it. Let me just compliment you. Uh, but that said, everybody's talked about somewhat of a big government type solution. You're going to need a lot of structure here. You're going to need this big overarching overhead. Uh, and going back, um, I'll go to Louisiana, FP and Point Capi, Perry, small place, overworked, underpaid, driven, wise wondering why he's not home in time. Um, and that's too common. Now, what do you think about the direct medical care model? Uh, we have the written testimony from Q Alliance where, um, you know, you pay the doc 50 to 100 bucks a month, depending on the complexity and age of the patient, and she or he manages all the outpatient services. Uh, referring to the inpatient setting as a separate, it's not totally capitated, but it allows a doc to manage the outpatient, and then the inpatient then goes on another ticket. What are your, what are your feelings about that? I, I've had a chance to learn more about the Q-Lions model over a year ago and have been very interested in exactly the way they are able to risk adjust and charge a sliding fee per month for beneficiaries and have amazing kind of access points for those beneficiaries to email with their doctors, talk to them. And I think that that's a great model, which would actually fit in nicely with helping to offer a flexibility for a primary care physician in Louisiana to do something exactly like that. And in, that would be a very rich way to ensure financial sustainability in their practice, yeah, all, the while, all the while really creating models inside that practice that reward coordination. Let the doctors and the MAs and the nurses figure out what they need to do. Sounds good. Uh, my last thing, and I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sirota, for the record, I'll ask you if you could give us your MLR for your various MA plans and what you estimate that um, the MLR is of the group with whom you're contracting, because I think that would be very informative to us. Uh, we can get that information for Thank you. you. Chair, uh, thanks, gentlemen. Now it goes to uh, recognizes Mr. Dingle for five minutes for questions. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I commend you for this hearing. I commend the panel. This is one of the best presentations and one of the best hearings I've heard in quite a while. I also want to uh, commend our panelists for their fine testimony. These questions will go to Dr. Patel. I want to thank you for being here today. Please answer the following questions, yes or no. Is it fair to say from your testimony that fee-for-services models do not promote the highest quality and highest value health care? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, is it also fair to say that models such as the patient-centered medical home have the most promise to provide our citizens with the best and most affordable health care? Yes or no? Yes. Is it possible that other benefits from these things could uh, occur, uh, such as a reduction in both cost and the rate of growth of cost? Yes. Now, Doctor, I believe that on March 23, 2010, the President signed the Affordable Care Act into law. I'm sure you're aware that ACA provides a shared savings program through accountable care organizations that serve 2.4 million Americans. Is that right? Yes. Now, Doctor, ACA is legislation that includes the authority to embark on many innovative paths. Uh, I believe that is a desirable thing, is it not? Yes. Now, Doctor, are you aware that CMS programs such as Innovation Advisor 
and innovation, innovation challenge grants uh, that seek to promote groundbreaking work in healthcare. Um, would you say that is useful, yes or no? Yes. By the way, doctor, I'm sorry to do this to you. You're, you're a very good witness, but I've got a lot of questions and not much time. No problem. Observe. Dr. Patel, it's clear from your testimony that you understand the importance of excellent primary care. Uh, this is an area of great shortage in this country and potentially worse shortage, is it not? Yes. Did you know that CMS has a comprehensive primary care initiative that encourages public-private collaboration on, on promoting primary care? Yes, yes or no? Dr. Patel, I think we both agree that CMS must do more to reform physician payment systems. Is that your view? Yes. And I hope you also recognize that the Affordable Care Act is assisting CMS in beginning the important process towards these vital reforms. Do you agree with that statement? Yes, sir. Doctor, do you want to make a comment as to how that particular process is working? This is not a yes or no <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I'm happy to just briefly tell you that I do know that CMS has been working even with the most recently mentioned uh, physician payment rule that was released last week to add modifications that acknowledge some of the issues we've discussed today around the relative value of some of fee-for-service elements as well as ways to better integrate quality with what work that is already going on in clinical specialty societies and primary care. Does that offer promise for the future in addressing these miserable problems we have? It does, sir. Uh, with regard to cost increases and things of that kind? It does, and it also offers insights into what we need to do more work in, even outside of the Medicare program. Now, how, does, how, how is it that, that this program is going to benefit us in terms of addressing cost increases and the rate of increase of costs? It, it all has to do with making sure that what we're incentivizing, where we put the dollars, actually matches towards the value that has already been identified that we do not attain in this country. So it's really about taking resources that we know are not going towards valuable care and redirecting those towards things that we know promote value. And those come from the very work that we're hearing about that are led by clinicians. Now, you just said something very important. How do we do that? So, What are the steps that we take to make that The happen? very short-term steps over the next two yeah. years, for right. example, transferring a proportion of what we do in fee-for-service payment right now into this coordinated care model that we're discussing. It's even beyond the patient-centered medical home. It could be a model that allows for an oncologist, for example, to better coordinate care for a colorectal cancer patient. And then from that point, what we can't do is leave it alone at that step. What we must do is transfer and think about how that money, those dollars and care coordination can not only be reinvested back into the system, but what savings we create from that can move towards either these larger kind of episode or bundled payments that we've discussed or other mechanisms that other physicians have brought up today. Do you believe that the medical profession will support that? I believe they will, and I believe they've already been putting these models forward, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, five minutes for questions. Well, thank you much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks very much to our panel members for being with us today. It's, it's been very, uh, very enlightening. And if I could start, uh, Mr. Serrato, if I could ask you, uh, kind of interesting, in your first uh, page of your testimony, you, have, you state that uh, U.S. health care uh, spending exceeds $2.5 trillion annually, and the studies estimate that $0.30 cents of every health care dollar goes to care that is ineffective or redundant, and those dollars are uh, not being well spent. Let me ask you, why, why is that happening, and where are those dollars going? Well, I, I think you've heard uh, virtually everyone on the panel uh, answer that question in, in a slightly different take, but the reality is that we're providing care, as Dr. Patel just said, that isn't valuable, and we need to redirect that care to things that are going to provide uh, better outcomes. Why is it happening? We have a system that incents volume and doesn't incent population management, quality, and outcomes. So when you, create, when you have a system that incents volume, you get volume, and, and that's, what's, that's what's transpiring. Let me ask, though, uh, 
are a lot of, does this include a lot of tests that don't need to be done because folks out there are fearful if they don't do the test that they'll be held liable? Certainly. And what should we do about that? Well, I, th I think we have to look at the health care system comprehensively, which would include looking at, uh, at reforming the tort system as well. Uh, Dr. Nash, I saw you uh, nodding your head. Yes, uh, absolutely correct. I mean, if you speak to physicians, uh, that's the first thing they'll put forward and it was raised even in today's discussion. Uh, but the other side of the coin is really the patients and, you know, the patients' demand for services because of their own anxieties and concerns and both need to be dealt with. And that's one of the things that, you know, we've been talking about around here and that we have to get done because you can't really, uh, re you know, have meaningful health care reform if we don't do something about the tort system in this country and a lot of these junk lawsuits. Uh, let, me, let me ask uh, uh, this question. Uh, we've got, and this is to uh, Dr. Bronson. I was just over at Cleveland Clinic on uh, Monday for a meeting, and I'm from Northwest Ohio. But, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about what's happening in the healthcare system here, but let me ask you this. Uh, we hear a lot about the physician's uh, role in promoting high quality of care and avoiding unnecessary spending. And, you know, really, what is the role of the patient now that we have to be looking at? Well, the role of the patient is very important, and that's why we support initiatives to uh, get patients more actively engaged in shared, shared, was on, uh, shared uh, decision making in an effective manner, and that should be supported in practices. I would like to add to the comment on liability reform that we're very strongly in support of a variety of steps for liability reform. And you may recall that I came to your office and spoke to you about the concept of health courts as an, uh, something that we should test nationally to see if having impartial judges involved in this type of process instead of uh, volatile juries could be a more effective manner in handling liability reform. Well, as we uh, look at that, uh, how do we incentivize those patients to make sure that they can do more and those people that are in the system to make sure that, uh, you know, they're not, uh, you know, we were talking about this the other day about, uh, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, folks didn't go to the emergency room as much. You know, folks might have stayed home and taken care of things a little bit more, but how do we incentivize those people for making better health care decisions on their own? Well, uh, n n number, number one, when you have, you have to fix the, fix the access problem in primary care. My experience is patients really don't want to be sitting for three hours to four hours in their emergency room waiting, for, waiting to be seen for an acute minor problem. Uh, they would really re rather see their personal physician. But part of the concept of wh what we're getting at is re rewarding efforts to enhance access to restructure practices to be more effective, to, to use extenders more f efficiently in practices to get patients in. <laughs> uh, we believe that those types of steps will uh, uh, reduce un, uh, unnecessary utilization and hopefully pre uh, avoid preventable admissions ex ex and uh, expenses. Okay, uh, if I could, uh, Dr. Nash, ask you this question. You know, if the, if the SGR, let's just say, is reduced uh, at the end of this year uh, by, you know, the 27.5%, how would that affect rural areas in this country and would, be, would they suffer a disproportionate hit more than an urban area? Would you, how would you see that? If it was not. It, right. If, 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 if right, it remained if, in force. Right. Yeah, it would be devastating. Uh, you know, the access that, uh, currently for Medicare patients across the country, particularly in rural areas, is threatened uh, even, uh, even in the current state, uh, let alone if that, if that was the outcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Recognize the gentleman from New York, Bishop Towns, five minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, let me begin by first thanking you for having this hearing and to thank these panelists for outstanding testimony. I think that, uh, as has been stated, uh, this is a very serious issue. And of course, um, I think that we need to spend as much time as we need to do in order to try and correct some of the problems that are going on as we look at access and, of course, uh, liability and all of these things, I think, are connected. So let me begin with you, um, uh, uh, Dr. Patel. If we shift away from the FFS payment system, what would that transition process look like? Uh, you have identified the resource-based relative value scale, particularly the RVUs, as a source of much trouble, directing focus to volume instead of value. So are you proposing we do away with RVUs altogether? And how else can we quantify the value of physician services? I think it's important to preserve 
the notion of, of what a value unit is. I think it's what relative value units have been that have been the problem. So in a transition, I mentioned that even in a long-term vision, we would need to keep some elements of our current reimbursement system because there are elements that work. But I do think that in order to improve the RVU process, as well as how we incentivize some of the fee-for-service services that we cover in the short term, in the next year or two, we need to actually identify what it is that we're not deriving value from and what that amount of dollars are in the Medicare system and translate that to models that are not necessarily RVU driven. That doesn't mean we're eliminating all the RVUs, but taking the proportion of RVUs that we know are really not providing that very term relative value and improving upon them to create incentives for care coordination. So taking what we have, not eliminating it totally, taking what we have that we know does not provide value and translating that into dollars and payments that do provide value and improving, meanwhile, I think, improving upon the RVU system, which is what CMS is trying to do right now with the updates to payments in primary care, for example. All right, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Hort, you mentioned the right infrastructure is absolutely provide, uh, uh, in order to provide high quality care. Um, what do you really mean by that? Could you expound on that? Well, uh, you know, I think when you describe uh, standards for care, you're really describing outcome standards or uh, you're, you're addressing what the, the ultimate goal of treating a disease is. The infrastructure standards are really the details of the uh, actual physical plant, the uh, communications, uh, the essential specialists that need to be part of decision making. And when you're talking about complex disease, having consensus and then, then committing to the building of the infrastructure is, is really the second step in the quality process. So, for instance, if you're going to develop a trauma center, which was my background, you have to commit to certain elements. If you're going to develop a cancer center, you have to, to commit to certain elements. And you have to do more than that. You have to actually commit to being externally peer-reviewed if you're really going to assure the public that what you say you're doing, you're actually doing. You know, the term here today has been used, one size does not fit all. And what do you really mean by that? I understand what you're saying, but what do you really mean when you say one size does not fit all? Uh, I, I don't believe that was my comment, but I'll be glad to Same comment. Same with Dr. Patel. <laughs> I, I do not think that the very situation we got into with our current reimbursement system was an attempt over time to have a unifying kind of standard. Even though we talked about relative value units, what we've ended up doing is really incentivizing volume. And so to say that one size does not fit all, that is an acknowledgment that not every clinical practice, when you open the door to see the doctor, is going to look the same, nor should it look the same. And that's the kind of payment model that Medicare needs to reach, so that we're not actually just saying to doctors, which is what we're doing right now, We'll pay you more if you do more. That's not a message we should send. And so one size fits all means that there are many different models, and we're already seeing some of those in practice, that can offer more value and save the system money overall. All right. Thank you very much. And I see my time has expired. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now recognizes Dr. Gingry for five minutes for questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I'll go uh, first to Dr. Bronson and Dr. Hoyt. Uh, Doctor, as you were asked uh, uh, earlier uh, in your testimony in, in the Q&A uh, about the OCO money uh, being used to uh, eliminate the cliff uh, in regard to the uh, SGR problem and fixing, eliminating the SGR and, of course, paying the $300 billion to get the baseline back to zero. Uh, and OCO money, for those who might not know, I think everybody pretty much does, overseas contingency operation, basically uh, supplemental uh, appropriations that are used on an annual basis to fund a war effort, not part of the, the standard appropriations procedure, emergency funding. So if you don't uh, use that money, if you've cut back on the war effort and you don't need it, 
uh, how can you actually use it to pay for something else? And you said you would be in favor of using it to pay for something else. Uh, do you want to uh, confirm that that's your opinion on that, both of you, Dr. Bronson and no, Dr. I, I, will I will confirm that. Of course, it's a congressional decision, but yes, uh, I would confirm that we support that. Uh, Dr. Bronson, you feel the same way? Yeah, uh, Hoyt. Um, Dr. Hoyt? Yeah. Well, our, our, we understand the discussion of uh, some disagreement about whether it's real money or not or whether it can or, or cannot be used. We, if it is available and it exists, we would support using it. If funny money is going to be used, you want it to be used to, to, to kind of help your, your situation. I understand. We could put it that way. Let me say, I, let me say this. I support SGR repeal, and I think all physicians do. Uh, I also understand that because of Obamacare, uh, the Affordable Care Act, the threat to physicians is compounded by a second SGR known as IPAP, uh, except in this instance, physician reimbursements will now be used to control cost in all of Medicare, not just Part B. How important is IPAP repeal to physicians, and do you believe Congress and the President should rep uh, support the repeal of IPAB. Uh, again, Dr. Bronson and Dr. Hoyt. Uh, we, we support the concept of IPAB, but a significant change in IPAB. We think IPAB should be an advisory body to Congress who, with a straight up and down vote, could, could deal with their recommendations. Uh, the Congress is accountable to the people and should have the opportunity to respond to their advice. Dr. Hoyt. Yeah, we, we have not supported uh, IPAB in, in principle because of the concern that uh, there's not adequate oversight and participation of Congress, but also of physicians. Would the two of you, thank you for your answer, would you two of you submit that, that response to me in writing? I would appreciate that very much. Happy to. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Let me go to uh, uh, Dr. Patel. Dr. Patel, I just want to clarify something that uh, I heard from my colleagues, Dr. Mr. Dingle and Mr. Waxman. Uh, they made statements that uh, Medicare innovation would go away if uh, Obamacare was repealed. Uh, maybe they've forgotten or aren't aware uh, that CMS demonstration projects on payment models was begun back in 2005 under President Bush. In fact, the Institute of Medicine called for them back in 2001. Obamacare merely copied that idea. Uh, and Republicans would continue reforming Medicare if Obamacare is repealed. Would you like to comment on that? Do you agree with me or disagree with me on that statement? I agree, sir, that the concept of innovation as it has been introduced in Medicare started before the Affordable Care Act, absolutely. Demonstrations, in fact, it's important demonstrations that occurred the physician group practice demonstration and some other chronic disease demonstrations that have taught us what we need to do better and also where we did not necessarily understand enough about cost savings in the system. So I agree, sir, that they did, in fact, begin before the Affordable Care Act. What I will tell you that I think would be important to keep and preserve absolutely are not just the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which has a great deal of activity right now, but embedded in, into that language is also a number of authorities that allow the Secretary and, and the Centers for Medicare to rapidly scale those payments. Right. In, indeed. Let me, in my time is about to expire, but thank you very much for that response because I, I agree with you that, uh, as we point out, and, and there are a number of things that were mentioned uh, that are popular in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we always hear that uh, keeping uh, young people on their parents' health insurance policy until they're uh, 26 years of age, uh, even if they're not still in school, uh, is probably a good thing. Uh, eliminating uh, lifetime and even, indeed, in many cases, uh, annual caps, uh, making sure that children with pre-existing conditions, and, you know, I could go on and on. There are several things that, uh, just like this uh, innovation that existed before uh, Obamacare, PAPACA, uh, was enacted, these other things that we all like in a bipartisan way could easily be reincorporated into a new plan. And with that, I see my time's expired, and I thank the, the chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman, Mr. Engel, for five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just have to comment that I've heard uh, some of my colleagues on the other side talking about Medicare uh, potentially going bankrupt. Uh, the Affordable 
uh, CARE Act uh, extended uh, the solvency of, of Medicare. And um, I just find it very strange that um, we've, we've fought two wars on a credit card and we've had Bush tax cuts for the wealthy, uh, Medicare Part D unpaid for. Um, we had a uh, surplus uh, when Bill Clinton left office and we could have used that to shore up Medicare. So um, I, I think that when we, when we kind of look at, at why we are in the trouble we're in, there's, there's a lot of blame uh, to go around on all sides. Um, first of all, let me, let me thank all of you for excellent testimony. Every one of you was uh, really uh, excellent uh, uh, testimony. And um, I think it's um, very, very important. Uh, this is an important uh, subject. I have so many questions, and I just have to kind of uh, you know, cut down. Uh, but let me just say, the, the SGR is obviously seriously flawed and needs to be permanently replaced. I, I really believe that uh, physicians deserve to be fairly and appropriately compensated for the important work they do, and the SGR formula is failing our, our physicians. I, I think there's, there's nothing wrong with physicians uh, wanting to be adequately and, and, and fairly uh, re reimbursed. And um, that's why I want to say that the uh, Affordable Care Act appropriated $10 billion in funding for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Innovation over 10 years. Uh, I think that's very, very important. Uh, but I want to ask this question. Now, all of us recognize the current fee-for-service model has resulted in an emphasis on procedures and quantity over quality of health care provided. Uh, I'm introducing legislation. One field I'm particularly interested in is palliative care, and it relies heavily on care coordination and communication with patients. I believe they're vital aspects to providing quality care, but ones that are not properly incentivized under the current fee-for-service system and yet properly done, I think palliative care often saves money, extends life of patients, and gives them peace of mind. So let me ask uh, Dr. Dash, uh, Mr. Sirota, and Dr. Patel, what role do you see for palliative care as a health care system undergoes extensive delivery system reforms, and how can we incentivize the integration of palliative care professionals into coordinated care teams? Uh, Dr. Nash, I believe, uh, that, yeah, pa palliative care Dr. is uh, Nash, ver very, very important, yeah. and uh, we have programs within our plan to work with our physician community and the community at large in regard to improving care at that phase of life. <clears throat> it, you know, it's difficult to, uh, in a few mo minutes, talk about how that should be incorporated specifically into payment models. I think it's a broader dialogue in regard that uh, on a community level that many communities across the country have been successful with. Yeah, this is uh, an important issue for us, and we do have a number of plans that have programs in place to uh, help members uh, with advanced illness. Uh, as an example, our Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield plan in Virginia has an integrated uh, cancer care medical management model, uh, which uh, is at its core trying to impro uh, provide improved access to palliative care. The uh, uh, members who receive uh, timely access to palliative care generally achieve a better quality of life uh, during these end states, lower costs related to end-of-life treatment and acute uh, hospitalizations. They employ skilled, uh, skilled care management nurses, decision support tools, medical director support, uh, and it's a comprehensive program. We also have a similar program in, in Pittsburgh with our Highmark plan that, in fact, uh, provides coverage for uh, uh, consultative services to its members uh, with palliative care professionals to ensure that that care is appropriate. We think it's an essential element and often overlooked. So we appreciate your attention to it. Thank you. Dr. Patel? So very briefly, the concept of a patient-centered medical oncology home is exactly alluding to the kinds of services you're referencing, specifically palliative care. Oncologists right now are caught up in the same quantity over quality system that we all have to be reimbursed in. And in moving towards a coordination type fee, oncologists have already put forward ideas and are practicing palliative care referrals as well as palliative care medicine in the space of their cancer patients. Thank you. Let me get in one quick question. Um, as part of the Affordable Care Act, Medicare started paying primary care physicians a 10 percent incentive payment. And it's my understanding that more than 156,000 primary care providers have benefited from this. Now, I, I'm curious to see what efforts are being undertaken in the private sector to incentivize physicians to practice in primary care. So perhaps, Mr. Sirota, Dr. Nash, can you elaborate on how your organizations are working to encourage physicians to go into primary care? Sure. We, uh, 
we have done similar things. We've uh, increased the rate we pay primary care physicians. An example in, in uh, Philadelphia, our Independence Blue Cross plan doubled uh, base reimbursement to primary care physicians, increased it, uh, paid out nearly $37 million additional dollars in 2011. Uh, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield has uh, announced a major investment in strengthening primary care, increasing revenue opportunities, bumped the fee schedule by 10 percent, including payments for non-visits, uh, <coughs> essentially care coordination, preparing care plans, managing patients with complex conditions, uh, and also have shared savings models for quality improvement uh, and reducing costs. So the, the whole concept is partnership with the primary care physicians to uh, improve their access to uh, additional funds, provided the outcomes and the uh, improved safety uh, is present for our members. Yes, and <clears throat> those physicians in our program who commit the time and energy to work over the period of time towards the principles of the patient center medical home, we put on our payment model as described, which uh, reimburses at a rate that's 20 percent higher in this global model than they were receiving fee for service, and they get another opportunity for a 20 percent performance based bonus, uh, which uh, you know has attracted a lot of attention among the physician community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, and I also want to applaud the uh, the panel for being here. Uh, I've been a member since uh, January uh, 97. I got sworn in, voted for the Balanced Budget Act amendments, it's created the SGR. It's been a, a bane to my existence ever since. Um, and we did that to preserve and protect Medicare. That's why we did it. Um, and every year we have to deal with this, and for me it'll be 16 years now in dealing with the SDR. Um, also, the you know just uh, I'm glad uh, Mr. Gingrey mentioned about the uh, uh, overseas contingency operations. That's not going to happen. Don't plan on it. We're not going to use it to fix the SDR. So get that off the table. Um, that's why this panel is important, um, because if we just use that, then we're in the same position. We haven't reformed. We haven't changed things. We haven't moved forward. Uh, I also want to address this. Um, uh, Medicare, by the actuary, says it's going to go broke 2024. Uh, it did get extended by the $500 billion cuts in, uh, from Obamacare. But the $500 billion also was supposed to go to help pay for the Affordable Accountability Act, the health care bill. And we had Secretary Sebelius, right, in, in the other hearing room, she admitted they double counted. Double counted $500 billion. Extend solvency of Medicare, pay for Obamacare. Um, that's what we're living under. So those who extol the virtues of that, they, uh, they are promoting the ability of double counting $500 billion. Now, Dr. Patel, that's not good budgeting processes, is it? You wouldn't encourage using the same $500 billion to say you're preserving and extending Medicare, where you're also using that same money to fund the expansion of health care. I would, I would not encourage double counting. Thank no. you. <laughs> I, I would agree. Um, so let's first, the other issue is uh, we, we've always talked about tort reform. We've always talked about an insurance, private insurance being regulated by states. The federalism, we're back on the federalism bandwagon. I'm glad. Helps us talk about this. Now we're talking about Medicare, but the tort reform savings if are significant, but we got this state issue of tort law and federalism that I don't think were ever going to occur. I know the uh, Affordable Care Act did provide some money for states for pilot programs, which I applaud, and I hope that more states look at that. Um, where am I headed with all this? I'm, I'm heading with this. I'm glad to hear what we're doing. I don't hear much about the individual consumer. I hear about the, the primary practice physician. I hear about, uh, I mean, we, we, the fact that we don't want, we don't want incentivized volume. We don't want overconsumption. We don't want one size doesn't fit all. Where is the consumer in this? Anyone? Uh, the word patient-centered is in, a, in, a, in this uh, effort, uh, patient-centered medical home. The consumer is right dead set in the middle. Where? It is key. Is how? Key. Well, uh, uh, how? 
Under a government-run program, what is the consumer, what, what skin do they have in the game financially? Well, they have uh, whatever co-pays and other things they have to uh, take Significant co-pays really affect change? Uh, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Anybody? Well, I, I I'll take that back. I do know. All uh, right, they, good. We're seeing a decline in our mar business and our market because of very high deductible uh, policies, and people are second-guessing questions about services and delaying services. Sometimes that's very effective and appropriate. Sometimes it's dysfunctional. I think it needs to be looked at and organized in a way that you don't harm the health of the person, but you don't incent overutilization. Let me go to Mr. Sirota. Yeah, Congressman, you, you put a twist in the question when you said in a government-run program. Uh, I think that uh, what we're doing in the blues uh, in our markets uh, is a three-tiered strategy, and the third tier in that strategy is patient engagement. A uh, critical element of success uh, for us in the marketplace has been arming patients with information about costs, about quality, about which providers to select, and having them actively participate and that includes actively participate economically as well as with information. Yeah, my time's expiring, and, and I appreciate that. And I'm just going to finish up with this observation. Um, if we don't do that type of process, health care costs are going up for everybody, and even the private sector. And, and corporate insurance, what are they doing? They're incentivizing their workforce to wellness programs. They're doing uh, healthy living. They're really pushing people, and they push it by what? A price signal. And if we don't do that in a, in a government-run health care system, and we always expect the federal government or CMS or some agency of the federal government to do that for them, uh, we're, we're losing the opportunity to really reform our health care system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Dr. Murphy, for five minutes for question. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, this is a great concern to me of how we handle this. Look, we all get it. If all things being equal, if you pay someone by how many widgets they make versus giving them a flat salary, they'll make more widgets. We understand that. The question comes of how we reform this, and we're throwing around a lot of phrases here, you know, quality, patient-centered, et cetera. I really want to get into some of the specifics. <clears throat> now, I think um, yesterday the U.S. News and World Report annual rating of hospitals came out. I don't know if any of you saw that. Big thing about Johns Hopkins was bumped out by Mass General and who else in the top 10. Are you all aware of how those ratings are done? Am I correct? They, they survey thousands of specialists and say, who do you like best, right? They use some objective measures. <clears throat> what are some of the objective measures that they use? Uh, some, some of the CMS measures. Uh, Such and, as? Uh, I, uh, the, the core measures, mm -hmm. I, I believe, are being used. I would like to confirm that. But there, there's a combination that depends on the specialty. Can you give me an example? Well, an example uh, in... Psychiatry, for, for example, mm -hmm. they use almost all reputation as, as an exactly, example. Exactly, exactly. So it's articles they publish, who knows who. Yeah. I look upon it as like voting for prom king and queen. Right, right. <clears throat> they do not, because you can't survey thousands of specialists around the country and ask them which hospital has the best outcome measures, who has the fewest surgical complications, who has the fewest nosocomial infections, and who has the fewest... Um, ventilator-assisted uh, uh, infections, who has uh, longer or shorter than expected risk-adjusted length of stay in an ICU, who has different rehospitalization rates. Yet, am I correct in saying those are the kind of things we need to be measuring? Okay. Now, I'm wondering in that, in terms of uh, those, if there's, and if there's other ideas you have too, how we change this system from what I refer to as the poke, prod, pinch, push, pull, and prescribe payment system. As you know, that's what we get paid for as healthcare professionals. We want to pay for quality. Uh, in a very specific way, uh, do we then attach dollar value to some of these things? So if a hospital has um, a decline in the number of ICU days, a decline in the number of readmissions, a decline in the number of nosocomial infections, how do we pay for that? Well, Any, anybody? <clears throat> Dr. We, we, as mentioned earlier, we do have experience working with our hospital partners, and we're you know, a regional plan, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really a shared savings approach, not this too dissimilar to what Medicare is looking at, and that is where we identify opportunities where there's a chance to improve yeah. quality, and instead of just taking all that savings and funneling them back into premium reductions, we're sharing some of that with the hospitals for the opportunity so for them to transform their systems. I, does, I just want to make sure, because I'm, I'm trying to understand this. I'm not trying to put any on the spot. I mean, I've been work on this since I wrote the Patient Bill of Rights Law in Pennsylvania when we were fighting managed care plans, who would give a global payment to a practice or hospital and say, you figure it out. And the scandals that came out of there were uh, 
people were told you couldn't, you had to drive by this emergency room because you had to go to this one because this is the one that's covered. Or you were not going to get covered for this, we're going to cover you for that. And my worry is that um, I want to make sure we don't get into that kind of models where someone is just saying, okay, well, we'll save money today so we can get paid with this year's fund. And if the patient ends up with problems next year, that's okay. They're probably going to be with a different insurance company. How do we avoid that? Dr. Well, Mattel, you look like you're I reaching. think, yeah, I, I wanted to just say that the two things we do to avoid that, we shouldn't have something that's so absolute, like a reduction in ICU days or a reduction in, in that, unless we know that the second piece of information exists, which is that a reduction in ICU days is actually proven by evidence to have improved outcome in some way. So mm -hmm. okay. the, the scenario that you're describing, I think the way to instill, we've all talked in our societies and in our clinical professions about some of the metrics that we're coming up with even sure. as we speak to ensure that those exact examples don't happen. Uh, what you just said is, is absolutely golden and something that uh, this committee actually discussed when we were at it was knocked out of the health care bill. And that was if we allow the societies, the colleges, the specialties in medicine that have their own protocols to determine things appropriate as opposed to an IPAP board, it's a big difference. An IPAP board it takes an act of Congress to change what they're coming up with. But you're saying this is something that uh, the various professional medical organizations themselves are constantly looking at? Yes. Uh, Dr. Hoy, you were going to say something on that? Well, uh, yeah, I just, I, in, we've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and in our model, the updates would really require an annual rethinking of what the new target would be. Mm -hmm. uh, realizing that as a group of physicians reach a target, that's no longer going to incentivize them to reduce costs, so you're going to have to switch the target. Sure. But I think if, if the professional societies are charged with developing that, they're, they're capable of it. Anyone else want to come in? I know we're on. So yeah, I, I guess I would just say that in our in our programs, we call it blue distinction. We use professional societies to determine the appropriate quality standards, and and we do want to be careful to avoid substituting one piecework measure for another piecework measure. So if sure. we're not paying for poking and prodding, but we're paying for days reduction, we're still not getting at paying for outcomes, paying for better quality and better outcomes, which is where I think we ultimately have to. Get. And, and I think this is one of those things we still have to figure out how to do this, because quality is a very nebulous term. But I still believe that empowering uh, the professional colleges and uh, societies and panels in medicine is, is more important than having an IPAD board, by which by law has to be less than half of physicians and medical people. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. That concludes the members of the subcommittee. We have Dr. Christensen, who's here to ask questions. Dr. Christensen, you're recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and no question the SGR has outlived its non-usefulness and we need a new methodology to fairly and adequately uh, reimburse physicians and other providers for care. But just to get this off my chest for the record, if the system had been set up to pay primary care physicians for what we've always done, provide patient-centered care, uh, spend time with patients and their families and provide comprehensive care, whether at home, in the hospital, or in, in the office, and to coordinate the care with specialists, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, the Affordable Care Act, though, has done much to lay the foundation to change this and add new models of care that are being tested that you've been discussing and enable us to once again practice the art of medicine. And again, for the record, it has n strengthened Medicaid, it has improved benefits, and it has actually lengthened the solvency rather than um, hurt Medicare. Um, but this hearing is a really good beginning to move us forward. I want to thank the chair and ranking member for holding it and thank all of our panelists for their time, their work, and their thoughtful testimonies. I want to ask everyone um, this question. How did the approaches that you're recommending take into account physicians and other providers of color or who work in poor communities where services are very limited and the patients are sicker, um, with many comorbidities, especially when we're focusing a lot on outcomes. How do we take into account where that patient started from? And when we're talking about evidence-based um, medicine, when many people of color and sometimes people with other comorbidities are not in the clinical trials that produce that evidence? Well, I, I guess uh, what, what I would say is our philosophy is I mean, the term that's been used up here is one size doesn't fit all. We, we really, in the blues, believe you have to meet the physician's practices where they are. 
and you can't take a cookbook approach across the country and say it worked here, therefore it will work everywhere. And you have to work with the local physician communities and the local provider communities and develop a program that starts from where they are and provides incentives, information, and data to help them move the needle forward so that from wherever they're starting from, you pay and you reimburse for improvements from where they are, not measures against some mythical standard that exists on a global basis. So we really believe that the closer you get to, to, to local management, the better the outcomes and the better results you're going to get from patient-centered medical homes. So that's the way we would deal with, we deal with those issues in all cases. Dr. Bash? Yeah, CD, CDPHP is our region's largest provider of managed Medicaid services. And uh, we partner very closely with our federally qualified health centers and uh, other pro providers with uh, uh, large Medicaid populations. We support them not only by praying them more comprehensively, as I've been describing this morning, which allow them to sort of deploy those resources as they see fit for the, those patients, but we deploy our, deploy our own resources, and that is we've created community health workers to work in the communities to go Great. outreach the patients, to bring them into the Great. doctors who aren't being seen, as well as putting pharmacists and behavioral health workers in those practices. Dr. Bronson, did you want to add? Well, there's nothing more important than that we learn how to reward practices for make, improving the health, health status of their, their patients, and you have to go to where they're at and, and understand the risk profile of that community, the risk profile of those specific patients, and have incentives that make sense for those communities. It's well, well observed that uh, uh, certain demographic characteristics will, will uh, not support well people with those characteristics will not achieve the same outcomes as as others in certain certain uh, areas and that's uh, very complex sometimes it's socioeconomic sometimes it's other issues of disparity that we need to understand so they, these have to be adjusted appropriately to, to support those practices we shouldn't disadvantage those who are helping those in great need thank you anyone else want to add yeah, our uh, past president, uh, L.D. Britt, has made the comment that uh, there is no quality without access. And I think um, that has led to us as an organization really trying to profile uh, where we're deficient in some of those areas. W one of them is in, in, in the sort of the systemness of delivery of care is to assure that limited access uh, populations, whether it's geographic or it's, it's economic or, or color, et cetera, that those are overcome by getting adequate data. And so we're really making a concerted effort to make sure that the data we collect at a large hospital in a, in a large city is the, the same as the data that we can collect in a smaller hospital or in a, in a more remote or, ch or financially challenged area to try and, and identify those problems and then start to create solutions for them. One additional thing that the Affordable Care Act included were provisions for coverage of, of costs associated with clinical trials, such that the very issue you describe with deep disparities in clinical trial enrollment, especially in cancer, can be dealt with, and that's very important. I thank you for your answers, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the time. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. That concludes all the uh, questions from the members. Uh, again, let me say this has been an excellent panel. Thank you for your testimony, your, uh, your answers, um, and we will send you any further questions from the members. Mr. Chairman. You would please respond. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just uh, wanted to, I, I've heard a number of my colleagues mention this double accounting uh, issue. and. Um, I, I think it's a red herring, so I'm asking to insert Secretary Sebelius's letter on the matter into the record. I would ask unanimous consent. Without objection, so ordered. I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask the witnesses to respond to the questions promptly. Members should submit their questions by the close of business on Wednesday, July 31st. Without objection, subcommittee is adjourned. Well, we're going to we're going to actually try and get a contract to get some people to, to model. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I had, I spent some time with Tom Russell. Enjoyed him, and I'm sure we can uh, find areas that we can work on. I didn't realize you were from Cleveland. I went to medical school there. Yeah, CWRU. Oh yes. Well, I'm a professor.
address over there. What, what, uh, no, I'm an internist. No, I'm an internist. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I went out to the West Coast after medical school, so I haven't been there. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much, ma'am. You know Dr. Britt? L.D. Britt? L.D., he's a man, great man. You, you would uh, enjoy meeting him, but he's really spearheaded this access issue for surgery. Take I know we've been doing well, 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 but great job. he really put an extra yeah. effort into it. Yeah. Yeah, we should follow up, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well. Hey. Uh, hi. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, oh, yeah, I really enjoyed your testimony. I wonder if you had a copy of it. I don't know. Um, I really we can get one. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah.